I'm Ethan Flacken, and welcome back to Live from Our Living Room. This week, I'm joined by Richard Pildes, the Sudler Family Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU and a leading scholar on democracy and election issues, if you don't mind me saying. Uh, Professor Pildes, thanks so much for joining me. I'm very happy to, uh, to talk about the Electoral Count Act. One of my Fantastic. favorite current, one of my favorite current subjects. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is for everyone, but uh, on the other hand, most people, myself included, were blissfully unaware of the Electoral Count Act until last January, when this ceremonial process to certify state electors became a focal point in an effort to overturn the election. So before we jump in, it's been a subject of debate between the former president and vice president. Just tell us definitively, does the ECA stipulate that the vice president can overturn the elections, uh, election results without due cause? Uh, of course not. Um, the, the act doesn't say that. And keep in mind that the constitutional amendment that regulates the process, the 12th Amendment, which creates the presiding officer over the process of the joint session, doesn't say anything about the presiding officer having that kind of power. Uh, and it would obviously be quite an extraordinary thing uh, if a presiding officer of a legislative body um, who's there to sort of you know, regulate the formal nature of the process actually had the power to do something like throw out the votes uh, of a state after millions of people have voted and chosen their preferred candidate for president. Got it. So what is the Electoral Count Act exactly uh, in that case, and what was it designed to accomplish? So the act was passed in the aftermath of our most disputed presidential election, the 1876 Hills, uh, Hayes-Tilden election. Um, and what Congress discovered when that election became so closely divided uh, and Congress had to determine who had won the election what Congress discovered is that we had no process set up, no framework, no structure in the Constitution or by statute for resolving a disputed election in Congress. Um, and so Congress created an ad hoc commission to resolve that election and Hayes became president as a result. But in the aftermath of that, Congress realized it needed to create a framework statute to try to provide ground rules uh, for Congress, should there be a disputed presidential election that went to Congress in the future. So that's what the Electoral Count Act was designed to do. It was designed to provide the ground rules and a legal framework uh, for how Congress should interact with the states in the context of receiving the electoral votes uh, and in the context of various scenarios that might arise, including particularly the scenarios that had arisen in 1876. You've written extensively about opportunities to reform this convoluted process. Where does that start? What's the low hanging fruit here that we can target uh, right off the bat? Yes, so some of what we need to do in my view with the um, modernized Electoral Count Act with the reform effort is to clarify various things that are already either in the statute or in other areas of law, but that are obscure uh, Congress doesn't fully understand some of these provisions, but then also uh, update the statute to deal with some of the contemporary concerns. Uh, so as you say, there are things that I think are, are low hanging fruit, uh, as I put it. Um, first, just to clarify that the vice president doesn't have the power to reject the votes from the state unilaterally. Um, second, um, as of now, as you know, it takes just one senator and one representative to sign a, a document, a form objecting to the vote from a state. And that then forces the two chambers to break apart from each other in the joint session, go off to their separate chambers, deliberate about the objection, come back to the joint session. Um, and I think there's pretty broad recognition that that's too low a threshold and that that has to be raised significantly um, to make sure that uh, it's only for really serious uh, major kinds of issues uh, that, that this process even gets triggered. The harder issues have to do with how you structure things so that we minimize the risk that the various actors in the process would abuse their powers for partisan advantage seeking uh, rather than actually faithfully applying the law 
meaning the law of the election process in the states as well as the law in the Electoral Count Act. Um, and there's some not, you know, definitely some legitimate um, tough issues that have to be worked out there. But uh, I am optimistic um, that uh, because this bipartisan process uh, is going forward in the Senate right now with a significant number of senators participating, uh, that there may be an opportunity here to do some significant reform, which I think many people on both sides of the aisle recognize um, would be a good thing uh, before we get into the next presidential election. So you, you made a reference to it, uh, but a bipartisan working group, what another famous New Yorker, George Costanza, might call a BWG, has emerged to evaluate Electoral Count Act reform. These BWGs have a mixed record and election issues, as we know, are particularly testy at the moment. So we have to go in with cautious optimism. But what do you think? Could there be a bipartisan path to reform here? I mean, I, I think there definitely is a bipartisan path to reform, potentially. Um, I think that, that there is recognition on both sides of the aisle uh, that we don't want certain things to happen with the resolution of our presidential election. Um, and, and that we need to clarify the statute and uh, build in greater protections for the integrity of the election process and the vote counting process. It's really critical with this statute that there be bipartisan support for any reform, not just because of the filibuster rule in the Senate uh, and the need for 60 votes in the Senate, but because the statute is largely self-enforcing by Congress. That is, Congress has to be willing to live with the resolution uh, of these issues that they arrive at through the legislative process when they reform the ECA. So even if, even if it were possible for one party to jam down their preferred vision of Electoral Count Act reform on the other party, um, it would be sort of pointless to do that because you need buy-in from both sides for the statute to actually mm. stick. And, you, and remember, the statute only really matters you know, if we are in a highly contentious situation uh, where the presidency is at stake. And so that's why I think it's especially important to emphasize that we need clear rules, simple rules, bipartisan buy-in, no ambiguity, uh, and a really firm structure for that moment. So I think that's the background context in which we have to think about uh, how do we put together something that will really hold with both sides in context of tremendous political temptation and um, ambition. This seems like the sort of issue where both sides have a pretty good incentive to engage. You know, it's the sort of thing where when your party is in power, maybe you want to resist engagement on electoral count act reform, but tides turn, uh, right. elections swing. So hopefully uh, they will follow that advice. Last question, Professor. One major strength of the American election system is that it is so decentralized and disaggregated. It's also a major weakness. <laughs> and there are a lot of points in the process where things can go wrong. So. Are there other friction points besides the congressional certification that are in need of reform and have a pathway to bipartisan reform? Well, there are lots of things ideally that I might like to see uh, reformed about the overall election system and process and rules, but, but trying to kind of narrow things down a little bit to, to issues that are directly connected to the Electoral Count Act. Um, I, I think we are obviously now more worried than we have been in the past uh, about our election administration officials. Um, as you know, um, uh, they have come under a lot of um, threats, pressures, harassment, um, efforts to intimidate. Um, a lot of uh, uh, experienced election administrators are resigning, retiring, because mm -hmm. it's become such a, a, an unpleasant, dangerous uh, position to be in. Uh, and so I think uh, we need to uh, make it clear that it's a federal crime, for example, to try to coerce uh, or intimidate or harass elected officials who are performing their jobs. I, I think we need to give them more assurance 
um, that they're protected. Um, and um, I, I think that it may well be that that kind of uh, reform gets um, embedded in reforming the Electoral Count Act because it's so close to what you're trying to do with the Electoral Count Act, which is to protect the integrity of the vote counting process. Well, Professor, it's unfortunately no exaggeration to say that our very democracy <laughs> is on the line uh, and that passing Electoral Count Act reform and reforming our election system more broadly uh, that the stakes are that high. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insight. Uh, thanks very much. Glad to do it.